Hey everybody, happy Saturday. Um, day uh, five, six, six of our um, isolation experience. It is uh, Saturday the 21st of March, 2020. 321, 2020. Um, I have a, a longish sort of a request reading to do tonight. So uh, I'm gonna get to that sooner than normal. because It's a little bit longer. Um, how are you doing? How are you all doing? The thing that I'm reading is actually called What Will You Become? And I've been thinking about that lately, especially over the course of the past couple of days. Um and I got to spend the whole morning as sort of an off day. I mean, it's a Saturday, so whatever. You know, what, we, what would you normally be doing on a Saturday anyway, right? So we spent the whole morning uh, just getting dirty and having fun in the backyard and playing in the mud, and uh, it was awesome. It was great. And uh, then f just after lunchtime, we had the opportunity to uh, watch a free concert by uh, Seraphim Affleck. She's a local actress and a singer, and she's an awesome person. Her and her husband live up in Concord, I believe. They're both actors. And she's an Elsa impersonator, Elsa from Frozen. And Uma has seen her in the library, and she loves her. And, of course, she knows all the words to all the songs. Uma does. I mean, Seraphim does as well. But um, so she gave this performance, which was great, a uh, live performance. And there was Uma, you know, sitting at the table singing all these songs with her. And uh, it made me think about what, I, what I'm going to read for you today. What will you become? Because I, um, I, I read a, a piece a while ago. And for the life of me, I've been racking my brain to try to figure out who, where I read it. And I can't. So I'm, I'll keep looking. And if I find it, I'll let you know. But um, there was some, it was one of the, the 20th century philosophers. And uh, he was talking about um, what people become. What in times of struggle... Uh, in times of emergency or chaos. And what he posited was that you become more of what you are, right? Um, if you are discompassionate and uh, lack empathy, um, you know, being, being in, a, in an emergency situation isn't going to suddenly um, change that in you. And likewise, if you are normally sort of a compassionate or um, an empathetic person, that you're going to become more of that, right? So it being in these type of sort of anxiety inducing times, um, in, in a sense, more polarizes us, right? Because you just go, you, you just become more of what you are. If you already feel one way, um, you know, you're not going to feel less that, or the odds of you changing your mind grow slimmer in an emergency. And um, I'm not sure if that is a if if that is um, heartening or if that's depressing. But what I do know is that with people like uh, Seraphim, that is absolutely the case. Uh, you know, she is one of the kindest human beings I've ever met. And, uh, you know, when we, in a situation like this, in, in sort of a collective, in this sort of collective soul searching that we're all doing right now, um, you know, people like her become kinder. People like her, you know, people like that become more like that. And those are the type of people that we should gravitate towards. Uh, don't expect the um, the politician that you hate to suddenly to don't you're you're not going to suddenly stop hating them, right? Um, so you know, lean in to to your loved ones and uh, the people that already give you emotional support because that's that's where you're going to get this from. So anyway, um, I'm down below here uh, in the comment section. I'm going to uh, post, uh, not in the comment section, in the about section. I'm going to actually post a link to uh, Seraphin's website, and I would encourage you to check it out. Uh, it's a very positive, she's very positive and very nice and um, deserves uh, our support. So um, every year or so, I go to uh, out to Rome, New York, the Rome Utica, New York area, and I do this little I do this little gig 
out there at a church that is run by uh, um, Anne Louise and Fred. Um, and it's a beautiful place. It's a, it's a, 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 I believe it's a Methodist church. You know, honestly, I'm not even sure because it's so non-denominational and they're so kind and loving and they've created this incredible little community around themselves and they let me come and just be myself. You know, I was born and raised in a, you know, a sort of Roman Catholic steelworkers family. Um, uh, I'm not, uh, you know, I have, I'm not that anymore, uh, but, but I, I kind of get uh, where they're coming from and what they're trying to do, and um, regardless of, and in fact, they encourage me to read and to talk about um, other cultures and other traditions. So I'm going to read to you a piece that is going to appear that I read for them, and Anne asked me, Anne Louise asked me to read it. Um, during one of these little uh, blogs, so I'm going to read it to you. This was something that uh, is going to appear in the new book that comes out in June, an essay um, about uh, um, Desain, which is a Nepali high holiday, which is one of the traditions that we do celebrate in this family. And, um, and Louise asked me to talk or to read about uh, spirituality and... Um, um, this is uh, sort of the closest to, to what I come to that. Um, and, and, you know, those of you who know me understand where I'm coming from. And those of you who don't, maybe this will help you understand. So I'm going to read that. And, uh, again, you tell me what to think. There's a whole comment section down there. And um, here we go. This is, <clears throat> this is called, What Will You Become? Before the ceremony, as the adults gather, you run back and forth over the cushions and blankets, quivering with excitement. Your grandparents are here for Desain, the Nepali high holiday, the victory of light over dark, a multi-day celebration deeply rooted in the Hindu Nep Nepalese experience and celebrated around the globe. But you, little one, you know nothing of Durga's great battle. No, you know only this, that you are the youngest, and your grandfather is the oldest. And that distinction alone makes you both special. You two are the beginning and the end, the bookends of the family. You sit down on the cushion opposite him, clasp your hands together to receive Tika because you adore him. And even at this young age, understand some part of what it means to you as ritual to connect across time with those who have lost and to celebrate with those you have now. As you two begin, I think, what will you become? In Istanbul, we paused with you in the Hippodrome of Constantinople, now a bustling thoroughfare to listen mesmerized to the call to prayer ring out into the ancient city. Then we set you down on the cool marble floor of Hagia Sophia to wander on hands and knees where for a millennium and a half sultans and bishops held court. At Thanksgiving, you sit next to your cousins and recite grace. And at Christmas, <clears throat> we pass a platki. But in the tradition of my father and mother, instead of wishing remembrance for loved ones, we break the wafer and wish those next to us peace, long life, and happiness. At Easter, we paint eggs. Before entering your great-grandmother's house for the first time, your aunt took you for a blessing before the house altar. You have twirled in front of traditional Sufi whirling dervishes. You have taken your first bites of solid food in a Posni ceremony surrounded by family in a neighborhood temple near Lake Michigan in Chicago. In our own backyard, you bring beads and acorns to our concrete Buddha. And in a garden at Arrowhead, the home where Melville wrote Moby Dick, the first book I read to you when you came into, your, into our lives, you wandered with your mother among the collection of delicate, extraordinary fairy houses, searching for inhabitants. At Halloween, you were Tinkerbell. From the time you first opened your big brown eyes, we had two options, nothing or everything. There was really no question that it would be everything, that you would be a child of the world, all the tradition, every opportunity to become saturated with the culture and the ritual. Hundreds, 
thousands of moments brimming with generational wealth of experience, all meaning, every color, never saying no, always trying to answer the many, many questions, no one path, rather every path. Because in the end, every single trail should lead to love. This journey has led to occasional abandonment, cousins you will likely never meet, sadly, and there will come a day perhaps when you will look down at the cornucopia of options spread out at your feet and you will embrace something exclusively, or perhaps nothing at all. Or you will continue to be a child of possibilities, a seeker, never satisfied with any one road, like your mother and father before you. I hope you will have no fear of the other, and I pray a constant wash of culture and rights and exposure to the potential of the human experience will create empathy. But it will still be a long time before any of that is tested. For now, you bend toward him and your grandfather touches your forehead like a skin conduit, like a flesh transfer of his heart and love. It is a moment of pure commitment between you two unweighted by the politics of worship or institutional dogma. This is simple. You are his granddaughter. He is your grandfather. But sometimes the most simple sentiment carries the full volume of experience and the memory of a thousand years and a thousand stories. My little girl, my Durga, part of me and part of the universe. You hug your grandfather and smile and wait for the next elder to take their place. Your ceremony is just beginning. And uh, it would appear that um, our journey here is just beginning too, isn't it? So uh, that's it for today. Seek out and bend toward the people who love you and love them back uh, because they are, during this time, um, they are loving at an extra high speed. Uh, take good care. Uh, take care of each other. We're all in this together. Wash your hands. And we will pick this up tomorrow morning. Take it easy, everybody. <laughs>